this is our second last uh, presentation. Um, we had Schedule 8 Hot Stove and we're at number 7. So I see some uh, familiar name um, in the attendees pod. For those of you who are new to our Monday Night Hot Stove, a couple of guidelines for you guys before we get going. Um, first off, if you have any questions, um, we're going to ask you guys to write down your questions in the chat box. So there will be no microphone activated for you guys. But we're going to um, use a chat box if you have any questions. So at some point, if you if a question comes to mind, you can write it down. We do not guarantee we will ask the question right away, but we will guarantee that at the end, uh, JF will be answering some of the questions. Um, pour ceux qui um, sont en français, uh, évidemment, si vous voulez écrire vos questions en français, ça me prend... All right, we might, <clears throat> excuse me, we might be having a minor technical issue there. Uh, we're just waiting for Andre to... Jean-François Bilingue, il pourra à ce moment-là répondre à la question dans la langue de votre choix. So, uh, on, welcome please. again. We're delighted to have J.F. Menard with us today. There we are. You're, you're, you're just buffering, Andre, but you're back now. Am I good now? You are good. Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't know where I was cut. Um, so uh, basically, what I was uh, what I was saying, I was introducing uh, JF and um, talk about the importance of cell confidence, especially for baseball players. Um, and I was going to say also that in the room we have Wayne, who's going to manage the chat box, and we got Michelle all, all, also on the, in the room. If you have any questions with your PD points um, after this session, you can reach out to Michelle at coach at baseball.ca. JF, thanks so much for being with us tonight. I'll turn it around, I'll turn it over to you, um, and I'll get you I'll get you going. Just before JF, just before you do start, Andre, we didn't get your comment en français. Oh, so okay, sorry. Uh, je disais s'il y avait des participants qui voulaient poser des questions en français, vous pouvez le faire. Jean-François est bilingue et à ce moment-là pourra répondre à vos questions en français. Si besoin, il y a. All right, JF, all, all to you now. All right, thanks, Andre. Um, thank you. Uh, this is a great initiative by uh, by you guys, Baseball Canada. It's a pleasure to be part of this. And um, I, it kind of cut out there, so I don't know if you did introduce me or not. Uh, I didn't hear anything on my end, so I don't know if the listeners heard anything as well. But just to quickly, um, so I'm a mental coach. I've been doing this for about 12 years now, and um, my my experience is very range, so it's very wide. So I worked many years for a circus, uh, Cirque du Soleil here in Canada, for five years, in the, from 2008 until 2013. And since then, I've had my own practice in Montreal, and I've had the privilege to work with um, a lot of different types of athletes, from Olympic athletes to pro athletes to musicians, uh, firefighters, surgeons, and all kinds of people that deal with pressure and that the mental game is extremely important whatever in whatever they do. So um, when, when Andre asked me to, uh, to do this, um, you know, I could talk about the mental game for hours. And I was trying to think of something that, um, you know, I, I don't know you guys that are listening right now. And I know you're from across the country and you're, most of you or all of you are coaches, probably at different levels. So I was trying to think of a topic that would be relevant to all of you. And self-confidence for me was kind of like a no doubter just because in baseball, which is like you guys know, is a, is a mental game very much a mental game and regardless if you're a hitter regardless if you're a pitcher um, regardless if you're in the outfield or i would argue as a coach as well um, self-confidence is extremely important to 
take those race decisions as a coach and obviously very important for the athletes to believe in, in themselves to perform well. So my goal with you guys today is to kind of simplify uh, the concept of self-confidence and, and allow you guys to learn maybe a few nuggets and how to teach it in a, in a more practical, efficient way to your athletes. Um, we talk about self-confidence all the time, but I've noticed throughout my career that um, people don't necessarily know uh, what it is exactly and how to teach it in, 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 in teaching ways to not only build self-confidence, but to be able to maintain it when you, when you have it and to be able to regain it when you lose it. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start just by, um, let me just figure out, oh yeah, so the arrows, I got to remember to press the arrows. Okay, so just to give you a quick outlook on the plan um, and for the next 55 minutes, what it's going to look like. So we're going to take a few minutes just to define self-confidence, my own definition, explain a little bit how I see it. Uh, and in a way, that I think you'll, you'll be able to relate to it as well. Um, I'll spend a few minutes to talk about how it works. So there's fundamental constructs that we need to identify and explain before I get into the strategies. You know, I'm a big believer of education before application. Uh, and sometimes as coaches, we fall in the trap of just wanting to give, you know, tools or give, you know, techniques to people. But uh, I've noticed that regardless if you're working with a 15-year-old or, you know, a 30-year-old, for them to understand why they do something uh, just makes them more, um, there's more chances that they will, they will apply it and keep applying it when, it when they see it actually works. And then we'll finish with the Q&A session. So I'm guessing presentation is going to take more or less about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll keep a good 15, 20 minutes at the end for, uh, for questions. So here we go. So just a quick, a quick definition to kind of make it clear and really get the ball rolling here. So the way I typically define self-confidence is this feeling of trust just from believing in your own abilities and skill set. Now, if I had asked you, um, if I asked you what would be the most important word in this definition, uh, what, what, what word would you choose? And I'm guessing most of you would choose the word believing or believe. And have you ever thought about this word belief? Like, what, what, how, do we, how do we get to a point where we believe something? Like, if, if we think this is the most important word of this, of this definition, and in the end, it's about if you do believe in your abilities and skill set, you will be confident. But if you don't believe in them, you, will, you won't be uh, confident in your ability. So, how do, we, how do we get to believe something? So usually when I explain this to athletes, I, I split it in two. So this is what I'm gonna do with you guys as well tonight. So first of all, the repetition of something. So the repetition obviously of you know, a skill, so regardless if it's batting practice or if it's defensive drills, repetition of that, but also the repetition of what you tell yourself in your mind that will allow yourself to be confident or not. Like, are you repeating some constructive thoughts? Are you repeating some positive stuff that will come back to things that will make you believe that you're confident? Or are you repeating stuff in your mind as an athlete that will, you know, throw water on your confidence and will, you know, put it out, which, uh, which we don't want? <clears throat> and the second thing is how much importance or meaning do you bring to that information that you're repeating to yourself? So let me give you an example outside of sport to, um, to make you understand a little bit more what I mean by the concept of belief, and then we'll bring it back to sport. So just think of um, a religion, for example. So regardless of what religion you might think about, I'm thinking about Catholic religion because that's how I was raised. So if you think of someone who believes a little bit in their, in their religion, it might be someone that will say some prayers once in a while. If you think of someone that's gonna believe even more in their religion, it's someone that they will say their prayers once in a while, but they're also gonna to go to church every Sunday. And if you think of someone who believes tremendously in their religion, they will say their prayers, they will go to church, and they might pray the rosary every day. And so this concept of repeating and repeating and repeating what you wanna believe in, at some point, whatever you tell yourself, your brain will listen to it, okay? And the importance and meaning of that information. So again, if we take that example of religion, if you truly believe that that structures your life and, and it's super important for you, at some point that belief system is gonna get stronger and stronger and stronger. So to bring it back to sport, 
it's the same thing. Like whatever you're telling yourself, your brain believes what it hears. And we got to remember this. So it's very important to think about what kind of information we put in our brain, how much we, we repeat it, and what kind of uh, meaning we bring to it. So let's get now and let's switch gears and get into how it actually works. So there's four things that I want you to keep in mind when you think about self-confidence, when you're about to teach this to some of your players or use it for yourself. These are four constructs, four things that explain how these strategies work. Okay, so the first one, we only build self-confidence from thoughts related to the past. Okay, let me explain. You can get excited about what's coming up. You can get prepared for something in the future. You can get enthused about, about something that's in your agenda in the next few days, but it hasn't happened yet. So it's not a fact. And so, so you, can't, you can't become self-confident from thinking about something that's coming up. Like I said, you can get excited. You can, you can look forward to something, but when it's time to build your self-confidence, the only way you can do that is to pay attention to facts, stuff that you've accomplished, stuff that, that you own, okay? And, and in sport, and I would say probably just in life in general, but especially in sport, we spend so much time in the future thinking about like my next at bat or my next game or the following month or what's this next season going to look like. And I'm not saying thinking about the future is not important. It's extremely important. But at any given time when you need to build your self-confidence, you need to remember that you can only build self-confidence from facts, things you've accomplished, so things related to the past. Secondly, self-confidence comes from you, okay? Self-confidence cannot come from someone else. And this is a common mistake I see regularly where coaches think that they can give self-confidence to an athlete. You can't do that. It's impossible. Like an, a, a coach can give some positive reinforcement you know, a coach can encourage a player, but if the athlete is not ready to receive that for any reason because he's a perfectionist and he's not listening to you, you might tell him that was a great practice, he did a lot of great stuff, and the athlete is just listening, listening, and says, yes, but I did this and this and this wrong. Your positive reinforcement was given, but it wasn't accepted, so therefore it didn't have an impact on their self-confidence. Self-confidence comes from yourself. So what I typically say to people is that when you are self-confident, it's your fault, okay? You're, 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 you chose to be like that. And if you are not self-confident, it's also your fault, okay? And the great thing about self-confidence coming from you is it's within your control. Um, and, and, and so if someone understands how to boost their self-confidence, how they tick, how they react to certain things. It's quite powerful because you don't need to rely on any external sources because literally it just comes from you. And that's why it's called self-confidence. The self part obviously represents yourself. We don't think self-confidence, we feel self-confidence. So it's an emotional construct. It's not a psychological construct. It's something that, that we feel, it's an emotion. And this is gonna be important for some strategies that I'm going to talk about later, but again, this is something sometimes we don't think about, but we don't think self-confident, we feel self-confident. So keep this in mind. And the last thing, and this is a little bit of a gimme, but at the same time, we tend to forget it pretty fast. We build self-confidence from good stuff, from positive events, from things that we've done well. And you might think, yeah, well, of course, like, no, that's, that's natural to, to understand. But at the same time, we are so good at criticizing yourself. We, we are so good at identifying these gaps that we're not doing well, like these things that we wish we would have done differently. Again, at any given time, when it's time to build self-confidence, you need to pay attention to stuff that is not only positive, but constructive or things that will help you build the way you want to believe uh, in your own abilities. <coughs> and this is basically based on the fact that human beings fuel on accomplishments. Like we're, we're just made that way. So I'll give you an example because you might think, yeah, but if a coach makes an athlete realize that they did something well, uh, which it's an external source, uh, which relates to this positive stuff, they can, they can gain some confidence from that. 
yes, as long as the athlete recognizes that, yes, the coach is right and thinks about, I did do that well, and might relive that moment for a second and say, that was actually something I did pretty well that I wasn't able to do last week. So keep this in mind. So as we're gonna get through the strategies in the upcoming minutes. So we build self-confidence from things related to the past. Self-confidence comes from you. It's an emotional construct and we build self-confidence from good stuff. Okay, so the five strategies that I wanna go through here with you are basically strategies that I've been teaching for years and it's strategies that I've learned when I was in school that kind of makes sense. But for the past 12 years, um, you know, I've, I've been honored to work with some really, really great athletes that have shown me that some of these strategies work very well and, and really help me fine tune them um, to make them to make them efficient. And so as I'm going to teach these strategies, I'm going to do the little bit of a, the educational part of how it works. And then I'm going to give you an example after every strategy. Um, and I think most of the strategies, except one, I will be using um, athletes that I've worked with. Um, to, uh, to, and I'll share that story and how they used it in moments to, um, to perform well on demand. Okay, so the first one, the importance of preparation. This one is, I, I, put, I put it in order of being the first one out of five because it is by far the most important. Never underestimate the power of the training, the practices that you do with the athletes. It's extremely important for your practices to be fun and diverse and for the athletes, you know, to enjoy themselves, but it's extremely important to make your practices hard as well. And what I mean hard is that to simulate things that they would live uh, in a game um, and especially on the mental side. So for instance, like maybe once in a while during a practice, if you're doing like batting practice or I, I don't know what kind of drill it could look like, but at some point, like everyone stops and just looks at this one player, you know, take a few pitches and make, you can make some noise, you know, get them to overthink, you know, like even shout some negative stuff for him to kind of tune it out. Um, this preparation will help him get into a game and think like, okay, well, I've practiced so hard all these different conditions. A game becomes easy. And I'm guessing some of you have been watching the documentary, The Last Dance. Uh, with Michael Jordan and the Bulls from the 90s. And, um, you know, I grew up with the Bulls and I admired Jordan and I, you know, I'm, I think the documentary is great. And if you haven't watched it yet, I highly suggest that you do watch it. And the first four episodes that have uh, come out already, and actually there's two more, I think they came out this week and I haven't watched them yet. But anyways, in the first four, it did a great job to show how the Bulls were champions in practice. Like the, the way they practiced was out of this world. And, and I would argue Jordan and most of the other players treated practice as more important than games. So whenever they showed up in a game, like it, it was a breeze, it was easy. They were just putting into practice whatever they, they did in training. Um, so never underestimate the power of preparation to make sure that the athletes come into a game feeling confident. So let me give you an example. If we relate this to school, because I'm guessing a lot of you do work with, with athletes that are, that are in school as well, and you know this could help them be better students. So if you think of, an, of a student that has an exam on a Friday, let's say it's a math exam, and the student on the, on the Sunday night, so five, six days before the exam, will make a plan, a study plan for the week, and say, okay, I'm gonna study this on Monday, this on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I should have enough time, Friday morning, I can go through my notes, and then I have my exam on Friday afternoon. And the student is super, super on, like he studies very well every single night, to the point where at Thursday night, he studied everything, and he feels really, really confident that things will go well on his exam. And you know that feeling on the Friday morning when you go through your notes, and then you realize that you know everything, like there's nothing out of, out of all of that content that you don't know. That feeling allows you to step into that classroom that afternoon and look at the professor and, and almost look at her or him and say like, bring it on. Like, I know I'm gonna do well. I know I'm gonna perform optimally. And the only reason the student can come into class with that feeling 
is not because of the teacher or the math class, or it's because of what he did for the last five days before the exam. And to show up that way, because if you take another example and you think of athletes that don't prepare well, um, they might slack off, slack off on the Monday, they might slack off on the Tuesday and then realize on Wednesday, wow, okay, I better start studying here. And then they study and they go to bed late and they're tired, not really focused. They don't have time to go through their notes on Friday morning because they have some extra, extra notes to study. And they can't show up at that exam and look at the professor and say, bring it on. And the only reason they can't do that is because of the way they prepared. And that student that prepared well from Monday to Thursday night will allow them to be confident. And that moment on Friday morning when they go through their notes allows you from being confident to convinced. And this is a, it's a subtle little thing, but for a baseball player to think about all the preparation he did and he's facing this team. I'm thinking of a pitcher, for example, who really you're facing a team you know very well and you studied all these players, you know their habits, you know how they, what kind of pitches they like and dislike. And like you show up on the mound and you realize like, I know everything, like I'm ready for this game. It allows the athlete to be confident, but for some of them who do it very well, to go from confident to convinced. And that is an extremely, extremely powerful feeling. So one athlete that I've been working with for the last few years is uh, Laurent Duvernay Tardif, who plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. And it's been an amazing journey to work with this guy, um, given that obviously he won the Super Bowl, which was awesome. Um, but because of his student background as, as, a, as a medical student, um, I have never seen an athlete study as much for games. Um, and, and what's typical is as an NFL player, during the week you get ready for the upcoming weekend and you go through all these different plays and you analyze your opponent and you know all their tendencies and statistics and it's, it's quite impressive in how much they need to study. And this is what he does. And exactly like that, that example that I gave you with the student. From, from Tuesday to Friday, he goes through everything and he actually does extra studying that most players on his team don't do. And then on the Saturday, he goes through his notes. And the Saturday is that moment for him where he goes from being confident to convinced. And when he wakes up on that Sunday morning to play, regardless of what time on Sunday, he's ready to go. Um, and so I just wanted to give that example as a sport example. And I think in baseball, it's very relevant as well. Okay, second strategy, the importance of having quality thoughts. Now, to explain this clearly, let, I want to show you um, a model that I created to, again, to simplify a little bit how the performance works. So you can take any sport performance. You take a, a pitching performance or a batting performance or a defensive performance, and you can break it down into three constructs, okay? The first one is a psychological, so what you think, okay, your thoughts. The second one is the emotional construct, so what you feel, so your emotions. And the third one is, your, is the physical construct, so uh, what you do, your behaviors, okay, your actions. Now, as we said a while ago, uh, self-confidence is an emotional construct, okay, the second one that I explained. What we need to keep in mind is whatever we feel is just a result of what we think. Like everything starts in the psychological bubble and we feel a certain way that makes us act in a certain way. And then from those behaviors, we, we analyze that, we reflect upon that, and then we might think something about that, and then it just twirls. It just, it's a cycle that just keeps on getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's why I was telling you a while ago the importance of having, um, thinking about constructive stuff, positive stuff, and your brain believes what it hears. Like whenever you feel a certain way, if you feel very confident or you lack in self-confidence, which is the emotional construct, you have to ask yourself the question, like, how come I feel this way? Like, what, would I, what was I telling myself just before I felt that emotion? And you're going to realize, like, maybe you were telling yourself, like, oh, this is going to be tough. Like, last time I, I faced this pitcher, I wasn't able to hit his ball. It was very difficult to read his pitches. Um, like, is that going to make you feel better? Probably not. But if you think about these moments where you feel great and you think about how your thoughts were organized, you'll realize that they were probably a lot more constructive, a lot more positive. And so to remember how this cycle functions, if you take the first letter of every uh, word, so the P, 
for psychological, the E for emotional, and the, the P for physical, it gives pep, as in pep talk. And I always believed that traditional pep talks from coaches uh, are very overrated. Like there are many, many sports where you have pep talks and you have many sports that pep talks don't even exist. Like coaches don't use those. Um, and, and think about it. Like if you think of some of the coaches you've had, and if you think of some of the pep talks you might use with your players, like how often are they really beneficial? I hope they are most of the time, but uh, realistically speaking, they, they don't always uh, have the impact that we wish uh, they had. But the most important pep talk is your own. And, and when athletes understand this, again, it's taking ownership of confidence comes from you. I control my thoughts. If I feel a certain way, it's I'm in charge of that. It's my fault. And it's much easier to put it into practice. So again, as an example, so I've been working with Mikhail Kingsbury, our Canadian mogul skier for seven years now. And um, working with him has been a tremendous experience. Like not only is he arguably one of the most dominant athletes right now in any given sport, uh, but he's such a great person, a great individual. And leading up to the Pyeongchang Olympics in 2018, he, uh, there was, he was carrying a lot of pressure. Like he had won, I think it was 87% of the World Cups in the four years leading up to the Olympics. Um, he couldn't finish second. He had to finish first. Um, and just for you to understand, like he skis a course that's more or less 250 meters and he skis about four to five bumps per second. Um, and it, it, I mean, what he does is, is just from a psychological perspective, it's unbelievable. It's one performance that lasts more or less 24 seconds, one performance, 24 seconds every four years. And if he screws up, he doesn't have a second chance. He's got to wait four years to redeem himself. And if you, you know, if you compare that to baseball, where if you swing and, and you miss, like you still have another chance, right? Or, or if you miss one of your pitches, you still have a lot of pitches left. So you can always, you know, bounce back. So the importance of performing on demand for someone like this, like this mogul skier was unbelievable. And, and to prepare for that moment was really, really interesting because we knew he was going to be nervous when he was going to be on top of that course for his final run. Like he's not a robot, he's a human being, right? So we put so much attention on controlling his thoughts and we did so much visualization and simulations to go through that moment to make sure that regardless of how many butterflies he had in his stomach, regardless of how nervous he felt, as long as he was programming in his mind what he wanted to think about at that time, he would be in control. So he's getting ready, he's clicking his sticks, fixing his gloves, fixing his goggles, he's got about seven seconds to eight seconds before he's about to go. And all he told himself was, I'm prepared super well like i'm 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 prepared exceptionally right now for this moment i'm ready this is what he told himself we practiced this and he did it in his world cups leading up to the olympics i'm prepared for this moment i'm ready and then instead of being uh, distracted by the butterflies which could easily make you have an inner dialogue that is oh crap um he felt those butterflies which, by the way, butterflies that we feel is just, I don't know if you know this, but it's just the extra adrenaline that's, that's um, put into your body that we feel a little bit of a oozy feeling because that, it, it, it extracts blood from your digestive system and brings it into your muscular system. So that difference of amount of blood, if you want, in your digestive system makes you feel a little bit weird in your stomach. That's what butterflies are. So in the end, butterflies are not a bad thing. Uh, Butterflies means that your, your body is getting ready for an important moment. So if you're not feeling butterflies, it's actually problematic. Um, if you are, um, and as long as you control them and you, you perceive them as being something that's helping you, it can actually help you. So he was ready for that. He knew the butterflies were going to be in Pyeongchang with him. So instead of feeling the butterflies and having an oh crap thought, he felt the butterflies and he said, oh yes. And then all he heard afterwards was three, two, one, and then he went down and had arguably the best performance of his life. And actually, for those of you who saw it live, he, he skied so well 
in the first few bumps, the first jump in the middle section, when he got, just before he got to the second jump, he actually changed his jump to simplify it because he knew he had accumulated enough points to finish first place. Like, to have the confidence and the guts to do that um, and to the self-awareness um, and the belief in your abilities and your skill set to be able to do that, um, it's trained. It doesn't happen on its own. Okay, third, third um, strategy and arguably my favorite one, the importance of celebrating little wins. So, you know, in, in the world of sport, we have these, this interesting expression that we use when an athlete performs well over time, like over like a week, two weeks, three weeks, we'll, we'll say that the athlete is on fire. And we say the same thing in French, il est ou elle est en feu. And I validated with other, with other languages and almost every other language in the world uses the same expression. And I always wondered like, why do we use this metaphor? How come we don't use like strong like the wind or strong like the current? I don't, I don't know, like how come strong like a fire, like someone's on fire? So um, I have a somewhat of a creative mind and, and I like to use metaphors and you know diagrams and stuff to make things sticky, you know, for people to remember a concept. So I wanted to understand a little bit more how, where this, where this came from. So my brother-in-law, who lives in British Columbia, uh, in Nelson, British Columbia, I don't know if there's anyone from, from BC in that area, wonderful place of our country, he, um, he's a firefighter, and I asked him at some point, I said, can you explain to me what a fire means to you? Like, when you went to firefighter school, like, how, how were you taught to treat a fire? Like, what are the characteristics of a fire? And I didn't, I didn't tell him I was asking him to make the link with an athlete being on fire. I just, I was going to make the links myself. So the first thing he said was, the size of a fire depends on how it's fed. So he said, like, when we enter a building, when there's a fire, like, we, we analyze what kind of building it is because this fire can really change fast depending if it's going to burn on something that will burn fast or not. And I'm thinking it's the same thing, like, from a mental perspective. Are you feeding that fire or <clears throat> are you throwing water on your fire? Like the thoughts that you're having, are you, are they, is it something that it's going to feed off or is it something that's going to die off? So I say, okay, that's the first link. And then the second thing he said was, um, a fire never goes unnoticed. And then we had a conversation about like, if you're driving in the country, in the countryside and it's pitch black at night and there's a, there's a campfire somewhere, like you could be looking anywhere but your, your, attendance, your attention is drawn to that little fire to the right. Like, it's unbelievable. We look at it right away. And I'm thinking an athlete who's on fire um, doesn't go unnoticed. It's the same thing. Like, we feel it. We see it. Um, so that was another link. And then the third thing he said was, you have to respect the fire because it can really hurt you. And, and then he went into details about like how they'll manage a fire and how they'll go about a fire and to make sure that they, they put it out in a, you know, in a risk, you know, like in a, in a secure way. And I'm thinking in sport, it's the same thing. Like when you're facing a pitcher who's on fire, or if you're facing a hitter that's on fire, like you have to respect it. You got to be aware of it because if you're, if you're not like, he's going to burn you or she's going to burn you. Um, so I'm thinking about these links and I'm thinking like it's the exact same thing. So if you think of the way you could feed a fire, there's two different ways, two drastic different ways. Like if you're sitting in a, in a, in a, you know, in a campground, it's your job to feed the fire. You can look at that big fire and wait till it goes down and then get up and get a big log and throw it in. And then it's going to come back at some point. It's going to take some time. And then you just wait, wait, wait. It comes back down. Again, take the big log, throw it in. So it gives a big fire, little fire, big fire, little fire. And if we link that with self-confidence, we don't want that. You don't want like a, a roller coaster type self-confidence. You want to be able to maintain it, right? So the second way you can feed a fire is we know the fire is going to go down if we don't feed it. Like that's predictable. Like it's, it's, it's just normal. Self-confidence works exactly the same way. If you don't feed it, if you don't keep putting some logs in, uh, it's going to die at some point. So the best way you could feed a campfire is prepare yourself. Have a bunch of little twigs, little leaves right beside you. And as soon as this fire goes down a little bit, throw something in and it comes back. So it's less variation. You know, it keeps that big flame. It keeps its strength. And if you're strategic, 
you know, you don't need to wait for the fighter to go down to feed it, right? Like some of these best athletes in, in different sports, they, they feed their confidence all the time. So they keep it nice and big and bigger. Probably the world champion of celebrating little wins, okay, or feeding his fire a little bit at a time is this athlete, Rafa Nadal, which everyone knows is a tennis player. Every single time there's something positive in a tennis match, regardless if it's a perfect serve on the line or if it's an unbelievable rally, you hit the baseline to win the point, or if it's just a normal a normal rally and your opponent puts the ball, his opponent puts the ball in the net, he'll do the fist pump. Sometimes it's a little fist pump, sometimes it's two fist pumps, sometimes he'll do it while he's jumping. He always, always takes advantage of celebrating his accomplishment. And for those of you who follow tennis, you'll know that Nadal rarely chokes at the end. Like if he wins a, a, a match in five sets, he typically loses the first two and wins the last three. Um, he never runs out of gas. He just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. I was watching a match against Federer a long time ago, and I had a pen and pad, and I was, I was taking a, a note every time. Uh, I was writing down every time he was celebrating. And I counted 82 times in a four-hour match. And just imagine being the opponent, seeing that, and just imagine like the fuel you get as an athlete, like feeding your confidence and your motivation and your mojo, like your energy. Um, it's extremely, extremely strong. So I'm thinking in baseball, it's so easy to celebrate little things. Like for instance, like it's easy, like those big logs would be like, maybe like a home run or a triple or an RBI or for a pitcher, it could be like a strikeout or it could be like throwing a, you know, a complete game or all these easy things to celebrate. Like you don't need to be, to force yourself to celebrate them. They're just, it's natural, but these little things like like making a great contact and it might have been a foul ball but like that's a little win um or as a shortstop like communicating well with your outfielders to make sure that the relay is done well to the plate that could be a little win even if you didn't touch the ball um and so to be creative about all these little things and keep in mind that there's nothing too small that the fire won't take to burn like the fire will take a dead leaf and burn as the same way that a human brain will take the smallest little thing and fuel on it. And so it's so much more powerful to celebrate um, little wins a little bit often rather than, uh, or celebrate successes a little bit often rather than a lot once in a while. Let me say that again. It's better to celebrate successes a little bit often rather than a lot once in a while to avoid those big varieties and to make sure that you keep it you keep it stable. Um, okay, and the last thing I'm gonna say about this is that we are so good at catching ourselves being bad as athletes, and as coaches, we're so good at catching the athletes being bad as well. Make sure you catch yourself being good just as much. Um, and that's not being arrogant, it's not being pretentious, it's being smart. Because like I said a while ago, the brain fuels on accomplishments, so why not take advantage of that? Number four, reliving past success. So if I ask you right now to think of a past successful moment that you've had as a baseball player, for instance, like that best game that you played where you were on fire, if you just took a moment right now to think about where that was, when it was, who you played against, like you probably remember like your uniform, you probably remember like who was pitching that game, you probably remember like the people who celebrated with you after the game. Like you probably remember these details like it was yesterday, even if it was like five, 10, 20, 25 years ago. When you play well, you get self-confidence from that in the moment. Like you just played well, the game is finished. You think back to your game, which happened, you know, half an hour ago. And it's like, those feelings are great. But if you don't take a moment in the future to think about that moment again, it's like wasted. And, and what's great about those events, like I said a while ago, is you own them. Like nobody, nobody can relive those moments like you can do it. Like they're in your back pocket. It's facts. It's stuff that you've done. And to relive a successful past moment, it allows you to feel the same emotions 
you know, the same spark, the same sensation of being great than you did in that moment five years ago, but you live it in the present moment. So if you think of like, related to baseball, like if you think of a, you know, a hitter who is getting ready for the game and who's facing a lefty, for instance, he's thinking, okay, I haven't faced a lefty in a long time. And he takes a moment to relive moments early in the season or last year where he faced lefties and the success that he had against lefties or maybe that particular pitcher um, and just relive those moments like hitting extremely solid and, you know, being patient at the plate and like having constructive thoughts such as like, you know, I'm ready, bring it on instead of like, oh, lefties, I don't like them. Um, and reliving these positive, great moments, it just puts you in that moment of self-belief that you had at that point, but in the present moment. So let me give you an example. So I've been working with this athlete called uh, Maxence Perot, who is a snowboarder who does uh, big air competitions and slope style competitions. Um, Max and I have been working together for six or seven years. Again, a little bit like Nick, very, very talented and a great, great individual. And um, I don't know how much you know about snowboarding, but this is at the X Games, and um, he's getting ready to go down a ramp, uh, jump off this humongous jump, where he's going to jump up about 65 feet in the air and travel about 100 feet in distance. And during that time, in the air, he'll be flipping upside down three times, doing five rotations while grabbing his board and landing on a slope that's about 40 degrees and landing on a snowboard, which I highly suggest you don't try because you're probably going to break your neck. And even if this guy is one of the best in the world, there's a fear associated to doing this. Like, he's always pushing the limits. So in this picture, there's still about 20 seconds before he's about to go. And you can see that he has his head down. And you might think he's thinking about the jump he's about to do. Well, you're wrong. That's not what he's doing. The morning of and the day before, he practiced the jump that he's about to do. And what he's actually doing is he's reliving that moment. He's thinking about the morning of in practice when he landed that jump perfectly three times. And he's just reliving, going down the ramp, feeling the air, feeling the control, going off the jump, doing the jump I just explained, and just stomping it. Stomping it means landing it in snowboard language. And just feeling that rush through his body like, yeah. Well, actually, it's, it's effing, yeah, but um, I'm going to save that uh, for now. I'm going to be careful with my language. But, um, but just going through that, which makes him understand I can do this. Like, yes, it's important to just tell yourself, I can do this, I'm prepared. But reliving the moment convinces you that, I mean, you did it just this morning. You did it three times this morning successfully, and you did it yesterday as well. And then he'll open his eyes, and typically there's about five seconds left. And then, and then the starter will say, ready, Max? And then he'll just give a thumbs up, and then he goes. So this is super transferable to, uh, to um, uh, to baseball, and then again, use your creativity, use your, imagine, your imagination, how you can transfer that to the different players. Uh, but reliving past success is extremely, extremely efficient. And uh, last but not least, so this concept of faking until you become it. Sometimes, from a mental perspective, you just can't con you know, convince yourself enough. Um, and it's normal. Sometimes we're very vulnerable and, you know, we're facing maybe a very good pitcher. We never had success against, against that pitcher. Um, but there's more and more research that actually shows that even if you're not thinking a certain way, just to act in a certain way, like to walk in a certain way, to make sure your shoulders are broad, you have an open face, you're looking forward instead of looking downward, big eyes, you know, relaxed face, um, will actually change the psychology of your brain. Uh, because there's some links between behaviors and the way you're going to think afterwards. And you might have seen um, Amy Cuddy's TED Talk at some point, and if you've never seen this TED Talk, I highly suggest that you go see it. Amy Cuddy is a world-renowned researcher that's done a lot of uh, studies on how our body language basically uh, shapes our brain, like the way it really changes the way we see life. Um, she's done a lot of work in the business world, 
And I think some of that has transferred into the performance world as well. Um, but I highly suggest you go look into it. And to finish off this presentation, I want to tell you a little story that I heard a long time ago about Dennis Eckersley, who, um, I mean, I was born in the early 80s, so I, I remember Dennis playing with the Oakland A's later in his career. Um, and I was actually surprised when I did some research that he actually started his career with the Indians. And there's this story, apparently, that when he started his career with the Indians back in, I think it was 75, um, you know, he's coming out as a youngster, full of talent, like people knew he was going to be a superstar at some point. And he was sitting in a dugout getting ready for his first game. And he was sweating, he was nervous, his heart was pounding, and he didn't feel very good. So um, as he was feeling like that, he, the, uh, the coach, which I, I don't remember who it was, I read it, but I don't remember the name, walked in front of him in the dugout and looked at him and said, uh, Dennis, like, you're not, you're not looking very, very good. Like, are you, are you okay? And he said, coach, no, like, I'm, I'm not feeling well. Like, this is, you know, I'm nervous and, you know, I want to do well. And, and then he just looked at him apparently and said, listen, look at your teammates. Like they're all doing their own little thing. They're not looking at you. You have, they have no idea you're feeling like that. Like right now, it's just you and I that know. Your opponents in the other dugout, like they can't see you as well. And all they know is they're facing a future, a future all-star, all-star pitcher. Like, you know, they're, they're not, they don't know you're feeling like this. And the fans in, in the stands, all they're excited is to see this, this newcomer be on the mound and, and, and deliver some unbelievable pitches. And especially with your style. So just go out there and pretend you're confident. You'll be fine. And then, and the way he explained the story is that he said, well, he's the coach. I guess I'm just going to listen to him. So he walked out and from that first moment on, walked out of the dugout, broad shoulders. And, you know, we know the famous mullet and the mustache and the big eyes he has. And the story goes that went on the mound and started applying this body language to intimidate um, the hitters. And, slowly he recognized the impact it had on the way he actually thought about the situation and and we know the history of his career he became one of the best pitchers of all time um and so uh, i just wanted to share that that experience because um i thought it was a great story just to show how even though inside internally sometimes we don't we don't feel that confidence we could at least um fake it and, and, you know, act like it. And at some point it changes the way we think. You know, I mean, if you're a hitter and that's what you see, especially with that sidearm, um, it's quite intimidating. I'm not sure I want to want to face that guy. So uh, for those of you who speak French, I actually just published a book a few months ago that um, basically shares a bunch of stuff that I talked about today and a lot of stuff related to um, focusing skills and motivation stuff and uh, stress control and how to be resilient, how to bounce back from failure. Uh, it was published back in November of 2019, so just about six months ago. Um, and um, the sales are going really well. We're really, really happy with the outcome. Laurent duvernay tardif actually wrote the, the forward of the book. And, um, and for those of you, it's only in French for now, but for those of you who speak English, um, it's going to come out in English in the fall. I'm going to have some copies as of September, and it's going to come out in bookstores in January. So for those of you who are interested um, in that English version at some point, stay in touch. Uh, if you want, what I'm doing right now is I'm collecting um, names already of people that are interested. I'm creating a list on my computer. So you can send me a message through my website uh, or just follow me online. I'm active on, um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and a little bit Twitter. I'm not using Instagram. So um, it'll, be, it'll be my pleasure to, um, to send you a copy at some point, or you can find it in the bookstores at um, hopefully in early 2021. I'm not sure what's going to happen with this pandemic, but um, it's supposed to come out early next year. So um, perfect timing. So we have about 10, 15 minutes left uh, for questions. Um, Andre Wayne, I'm going to let you guys. Yeah, for sure. We're, we're going to keep track of that. So the first question we have was written in French. I'm going to pre-translate it uh, in English for everybody. Uh, so the question from Stefan is, um, so what about situation where a kid uh, is really doing well in practice? His self-confidence seems to be doing all right. But when you get the competition, everything collapses. So how would you explain it? Is it only a self-confidence issue? or maybe something else.
Well, it could be a bunch of factors. You know, the one thing I tell coaches all the time is to reflect on how well is this kid prepared for the matches? Like, one thing I've noticed in many sports is that um, practices are too easy. Like, it's too it's too simple. It's too, um, it's not relevant to the actual performance. Like I always take the example of figure skating where, you know, if an athlete, a figure skater needs to land a quad, uh, in a performance and in practice, uh, and he only has one chance during his competition and in practice, like if he falls on the first one, he gets a second one, a third one, a fourth one, and he knows that he's going to get five or six chances to, to land that quad in a practice. It's not beneficial for the competition. Because it's not transferable. So how much is this kid, how much pressure, how much stress is this kid going through in a practice? And, and, and to, again, to be creative and how you could come up with drills where you get this kid to feel stressed out. Um, and there's all kinds of ways you could do it. Like, you know, one, you know, one easy way is you can ask a kid to um, sprint a few laps to get his heart rate up and then go to bat. And to, you know, to be able to self-manage himself, like being a bad and the heart is racing and he's got to calm down to reset, just subtle stuff like that. Uh, or the example I gave a while ago where, you know, at, at some given moment during, during the practice, everyone stops and everyone looks at this, at this player perform whatever it is, if it's a defensive drill or a batting practice or whatever it is. Um, and, and, and you tell the athlete, like, you know, you can't screw up, you know, you got one chance. You're going to live that pressure. You're going to live that stress. It might not be to the same intensity as in a competition, but at least the, the more you reduce that gap between the stress you're going to live in practice, which I would argue oftentimes it's low and the competition is pretty high. If you look at the difference between my hands, there's a big gap. But to try to simulate as much, and even if it's not identical, but as much what you're going to live in a competition, you reduce that gap, and therefore the athlete typically is more comfortable. I mean, that's what we do with the, Olymp the Olympic athletes all the time. We take the last competitions to simulate uh, Olympic conditions. Uh, and it's not so much about winning those last World Cups, it's about managing Yeah, yeah great. We've got a couple so questions for you here. The Olympics, um, I want to build off of ready. your comment no. around fake it until you become it. Love that comment. But take that as little, a little step further. And let's build in positive self-talk in the concept of becoming it. Is positive self-talk typically unique to the athlete or are there some standard words or phrases that work universally? It's very personalized. That's the that's what I've seen in in my coaching, and I would argue it's a big mistake that I see a lot of mental coaches doing is they use these common words or these you know catchy words that uh, they use for every athlete. And it's so personalized, and typically I would let the athlete come up with his own words. And and Wayne, I, I actually don't like the word positive. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I I use the word uh, the word a lot. Uh, the word constructive or words that will help you instead of hinder you or hurt you. Um, and the reason I, I, I don't like the word positive is because of this era of like, and it, this is highly because of, um, I don't know if you read the book, The Secret, that was published early 2000s, where it's this, the law of attraction, where you just think positively and things, great things are gonna happen to you. It's not entirely true. I mean, yeah, think positive is, will you know, make you react better to certain things, but at some point, if an athlete needs to live frustration, it's important to live the frustration. Like, and just to fluff it up with positivity, um, actually, sometimes we'll just bottle it up, and at some point it will explode. So, um, I get. I, I mean, I could talk about this for hours. I'm going to come back to the question you asked about. You know, are they just common words, or it's very personalized. I ask the athlete to come up with them. I might challenge the athlete to modify them a little bit or change them based on if I think they're not good enough. Um, but it's like anything. If the athlete comes up with it, he's more prone to use them. If it comes from someone else, it's imposed. And I, I, my, in my career, I've noticed that it's, it doesn't always stick. Um, and again, I just like this little, 
this little catchy phrase that says, your brain believes what it hears. Not necessarily what's true. Like your brain believes what it hears. Like your brain will just, it follows the words that you give it and it sends that command to your body. So, um, and again, a, a quick little story about how emotions and thoughts work. Like if you think of, if you were, if you walk on a dock, and a, 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 on a beautiful lake, and it's it's it, there's no like it's super clear, it's super calm, and you take a pebble, and you let the pebble fall into the water. If you imagine that pebble being a thought that you drop on your body, that pebble will create a hole in the water, and then it'll create ripples. Emotions are like that. Emotions are the ripples you see in the water, the ripples that we feel in our body. As we know, ripples in the water are temporary. At some point, they will fade away, and we don't see them anymore. Emotions are the same in a body. Every single emotion we have is temporary, unless you feed them, unless you keep throwing rocks, unless you keep throwing those same words that will, that will stimulate that emotion in good and in bad. So to think about that, and, and those, those ripples can become very, very big and strong, and at some point never die out if you keep feeding them. So um, not only is it important to find those practical words, but um, to make sure that they're meaningful, like I talked about a while ago when I defined self-confidence, and um, and to make sure that there are words not that are fluffy and just really positive, like the shift from positive to constructive. You know, that that's uh, that's really great advice. Any so let's um, let's lighten it up a little bit, but it's a serious question. Considering the culture in baseball, and you talked about celebrating and celebrating a lot. The little things, I'm paraphrasing, uh, versus celebrating a little the big things or in that spirit. Knowing the culture yeah. in baseball, yeah. even a fist pump might elicit a negative response from the other team. What are your thoughts about training athletes mentally for and taking that totally. into consideration? Yeah, it's a great question, Wayne. And, and for those of you who are listening, keep in mind that this workshop that I just gave, like this presentation I gave in 40 minutes, uh, sometimes I take an entire day to teach this stuff. So I'm glad you asked that question because there's something that I typically explain when I do those longer workshops that I didn't today. Rafa Nadal in tennis is a way to do it. You can, you can do it, you can do an external gesture uh, to celebrate the moment. It's not a gesture that's important. It's deciding, it's recognizing and celebrating the little win. But that could be done internally. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a tap on your, on, your, on your thigh or it doesn't have to be a fist pump. It doesn't have, it doesn't, you don't have to yell it out that you're happy. Um, but at least to tell yourself in your own little head. And, and, and so just keep in mind that it's not about celebrating externally, but it's recognizing that you did something well and celebrating it. And it could be just a little something in your mind. Great so advice. Time. We've got a couple more awesome. questions here before we run out of time. Keep so I'll cut right Simple to the chase on this one. Is there a, how young can athletes start doing mental training and how do you bring them into the process and how much mental training should they be doing? So I have two young kids, they're five and seven, and my wife always makes fun of me because she says, I don't parrot them, I coach them. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think they can't be too young. Um, you know, do I think that a seven, eight, nine-year-old should work with a sports psychologist on a weekly basis? No, I don't think that. Um, can we teach a seven-year-old um, how to reset uh, after a bad swing? Of course you can. Like my, my little boy who's seven uh, is playing baseball and he's loving it. And I've been coaching, I travel a lot for work, but whenever I'm at home, I, I, I coach him when I can. And, um, and I'm the coach that's responsible with the, with the hitters. And I give him all these little tricks and they, they don't even know they're doing mental training. But like, you know, if six, seven year olds are stepping up, 
to the to the T. And you know what's typical? We'll tell them look at the ball. Well, look at the ball is a very broad focus. Um, what I would tell the the uh, the little kids is you see that little stitch, like that little red stitch on the ball. See that? And I would point it, and then they would just nod. Oh yeah, yeah I see it. So that's all I want you to look at when you swing. And 95% of the time, they would connect the ball. Um, or like if they would swing twice and miss the ball, I would tell them, look at me. Like, breathe in, breathe out. And I just want you to tell yourself that you're going to hit this next one. And then add the little stitch technique. Um, it's just little stuff like that, that in the end, like I'm not asking them to meditate or I'm not asking, asking them to do, you know, like, um, it's, uh, you know, typical mental training stuff that older kids would do, but just re reliving past success. Like how many times did I do that with the little kids as well? Like I would say, remember last inning what you did? Like close your eyes and think about that. And then, oh yeah, yeah, okay. And then they would step up the, at the plate and you could you'd see their, their body transform, literally. Um, so I don't think they can be too young. It's just in the way you apply it. Um, the same way nice. that you would teach One last question, skills. Jeff. There's some and ways you would teach you see it often, you teach even a with older kids. So let's older players. So let's key in on older players, you know, 15 U and above, but adjusting from fear, being hit and being hurt by a pitch. How, what, what are some strategies that coaches can work with their players to get them away from that fear? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just looking at the time, and I'm I'm gonna try to be brief just to respect people's time here. Um, I mean, because I could bring this in a lot of different directions, Wayne. Um, I mean, just a, a very simple one is to go through, um, you know, destructing that fear. So just slowly, like, um, and I I mean, it, I'm sure it would be very situational. Like, if you're thinking, like, if you got hit, uh, like a a a, a lefty hitter. Um, against a, a lefty thrower, like obviously the ball is coming in. Oftentimes, and it could be a little be a little bit scary. You just de deconstruct that. So in practice, you know, you you make sure that that hitter is just taking some pitches, maybe slower pitches, and maybe they're throwing a little bit away just for him to get comfortable. And then you speak with the athlete, like how does that feel? Like how? And then you get closer and closer inside, and you just go through the different motions to build that up to back to reality. Um, but fear is a strong thing, and um, you know, fear is just something we make up in our minds. F fear is not, it's not an object, it's not a situation, it's not a person. Fear is something that we construct in our minds. It's a story we make up based on something that could possibly happen. So, I mean, if you think of the fears that we go through, small and big, like 85 to 90%, when we actually go through the fear, like we realize it wasn't so bad. Uh, like we make it bigger than it really is. So um, to have that conversation with the athlete and, and saying like, okay, well, it happened that time, but like how many times did you go to bat and never got hit? Like, um, and then you just like normalize the situation and make them understand like, are you, are you making it bigger than it should be in your mind? And, um, and a little question that athletes gonna ask themselves is at any time when they fear something, or they're worried or they're scared, is uh, do I need to be that scared? Like, do I need to be that afraid? And the answer is always no. Um, you can be afraid, but not that afraid. Like, it's, you know, it's not worth your time and your focus. Um, and then all of a sudden, the fear doesn't disappear, but at least it diminishes. Um, and one little, it's like kind of playing with a word here, but the word fearless, which means not being scared at all. Um, from working with some of the best athletes in different disciplines around the world, I've realized that even the best, even someone like Laurent, they, the, the football player, like they all have fears, like they're all scared of different things, but they fear less than most. So if you take the word fearless and you split it in two, you can read it as fear less. Um, so in the end, it, it's okay to be scared, but just don't fear too much. Like you just fear less. Well, Jeff, thanks a lot. We're uh, a little bit past the hour. Um, funny enough, I just got a text message from one of the participants, and he said, uh, "Well, that hour uh, felt like thirty seconds. Like, like we it, 
it flew, it flew by like like crazy, and I, I'm not surprised because I know you and I know how good you are with the, with presenting and and explaining <laughs> those key concepts to coaches. I want to thank you on behalf of of all the participants. As usual, guys, um, if you are interested in um, uh, listening to this presentation again, it is being recorded right now, and it is going to be available for you as all other ses sessions as well. Um, just to uh, conclude this week, I just just want to introduce next week a speaker, um, and uh, we're going to talk about hitting next week. And we got uh, Donigo Fergus, who is a minor league uh, hitting instructor with with the Twins, who's going to join us, and who's going to be talking hitting with you guys for for a full hour. Um, so JF, thanks a bunch again. Again, uh, it's been fantastic. I'm sure the coaches out there uh, took a lot of, lots of notes and will be able to implement um, those key concepts uh, hopefully this summer if we get if we get uh, if we get the season going. So on behalf of every, everybody here, thank you. Um, coaches, we'll see you next week for the last one of this Baseball Canada Monday Night Hot Stove Series. Thanks a lot, everybody. Stay safe.